So uh, I was preparing this afternoon in my mind, and a thought suddenly hit me, because a couple of lines came into my head, and I went to look, and sure enough, I was right. So here's the line. At the end of John of Gaunt's, one of John of Gaunt's speeches in 2.1, he says, that England that was wont to conquer others hath made a shameful conquest of itself. Now, what did we talk about, about the royal plural last time? Do you remember we said the king has these two bodies, right? He's, he's a person and he is the embodiment of the state. And that's why the characters are named for the state. Denmark means the king of Denmark, and Norway is the king of Norway, and England is the king of England. So now when you think about that England that was wont to conquer others hath made a shameful conquest of itself, we're getting to what Richard is doing in, the, in this second half of the play. Namely, making a shameful conquest of itself, of himself. You didn't even hear what I said. No, I borrowed a pen. Richard, like England, is making a shameful conquest of himself. Why does Richard fall? He doesn't fall only because Bolingbroke is rising. He, he deposes himself. He is giving up before, he's even, before it is demanded that he give up. And that's what we're going to see now. So we're going to start with uh, Act 3, Scene 3. We finished Acts 3, Scene 2 the other day. So Bolingbroke says, or Bolingbroke, by this intelligence we learn the Welshmen are dispersed. The news is good, says Northumberland. Now Northumberland's kind of an important character. He's going to reappear in the next play, um, Henry IV, Part 1, as well. And Part 2, as I recall. But he says, Richard, not far from hence, hath hid his head. And York says, at uh, line 7, it would beseem the Lord Northumberland to say, King Richard. Alack, the heavy day when such a sacred king should hide his head. Northumberland says, your grace mistakes, only to be brief, left I his title out. And York, the time hath been, would you have been so brief with him, he would have been so brief with you, to shorten you for taking so the head, your whole head's length. Mistake not, uncle, further than you should, says Bolingbroke. And York says, take not, good cousin, further than you should, lest you mistake the heavens are over our heads. And Bolingbroke says, I know it, uncle, and oppose not myself against their will. That distinguishes him from Richard. Richard is opposed against the heavens' will because though he has a right to be king, which he stands on, he has not performed his duty um, with merit whatsoever. Do you want to sit and join us? Just to see, thanks. Okay. Um, so, Bolingbroke then, they come to the, this castle there at um, uh, Flint Castle. This is in Wales. And Richard has taken refuge in the castle. All his men are dispersed except his immediate followers. And Bolingbroke says, go to the um, uh, line, whatever it is, uh, 32. Go to the rude ribs of that ancient castle, through brazen trumpets send the breath of parley into his ruined ears, and thus deliver. Henry Bolingbroke, on both his knees, doth kiss King Richard's hand, and sends allegiance and true faith of heart to his most royal person. Hither come, even at his feet to lay my arms and power, provided that my banishment repealed and lands restored again be freely granted. All right, so this is very problematic. I'm loyal, I'm coming to serve him, but provided that he repeal my banishment and give me my lands back, restore all that that he took from uh, after the death of Gaunt, his uh, Bolingbroke's father, in order to fund his Irish wars. <coughs> Let's march without the noise of threatening drum at line 51. 
Uh, methinks King Richard and myself should meet with no less terror than the elements of fire and water when their thundering shock at meeting tears the cloudy cheeks of heaven. So they're first cousins. They're both grandsons of Edward III. Um, and, but he's equaling himself with Richard. Be he the fire, then he says, I'll be the yielding water. The rage be his whilst on the earth I reign. My water's on the earth and not on him. March on and mark King Richard how he looks. Richard appears at the top of the castle. Yes? Do you think that uh, reign, R-A-I-N? Yes, is a pun with R-E-I-G-N? -E yeah. -E 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 yes. It's not, uh, he's not intending to say that literally because that would be, that, that wouldn't fit his MO right now, but it's underneath. See, see, he says, King Richard doth himself appear and doth the blushing discontented, uh, sorry, as doth the blushing discontented sun from out the fiery portal of the east when he perceives the envious clouds are bent to dim his glory and to stain the track of his bright passage to the Occident. He is like the sun. It's just what he said. He is the sun. There are two chairs over here if uh, anyone wants to sit. <clears throat> and York says, remember York is trying to negotiate between these two nephews without betraying anybody straightforwardly. Yet looks he like a king. And that's true. He is the rightful king. He's dressed like the king. He looks like a king. He looks royal. No, Richard. Richard at the top of this castle wall. Behold, his eye as bright as is the eagle's lightens forth controlling majesty. Alack, alack for woe that any harm should stain so fair a show. Now, where's the harm coming from? Well, Bolingbroke's rising up and he's got all these followers. But it's Richard <clears throat> who has brought it on because he didn't listen to Gaunt and his prophecy. He didn't listen to the advice. He just was doing his thing, his corrupt thing. So Richard stands there watching Bolingbroke for a while, and he's uh, high above, right? So in, this, in the Shakespeare's theater, it's probably the inner above stage where he's standing, looking down on Bolingbroke. And he says, <clears throat> line 72, we are amazed, and thus long have we stood to watch the fearful bending of thy knee, because we thought ourselves thy lawful king. And if we be, how dare thy joints forget to pay their awful duty to our presence? If we be not, show us the hand of God that hath dismissed us from our stewardship. For well we know no hand of blood and bone can grip the sacred handle of our scepter unless he do profane, steal, or usurp. So this is the old idea of kingship, right? You cannot overthrow a king under any circumstances in that idealized idea of the divine right of kings. The newer idea, or the more complicated idea, is that Richard has... Um, forfeited the right because of his lack of merit. But he's not seeing it that way. And that very fact that he looks like a king standing up there is all that he depends on. He has trusted in that, that is his right, without realizing that he can't just rule by whim and not be a responsible king. And though you think that all, as you have done, have torn their souls by turning them from us, and we are barren and bereft of friends, yet know, my master, sorry, yet know, my master, God omnipotent, is mustering in his clouds on our behalf armies of pestilence, and they shall strike your children yet unborn and unbegot that lift your vassal hands against my head and threat the glory of my precious crown. Well, does he know this? Sounds delusional. It's, it sounds like wishful thinking. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, it might be true. England goes through 100 years of civil war because of this overthrow. But he's not noticing that he's brought it on himself. He will by the end of the play, I promise. Tell Bolingbroke, for, that, for yon me thinks he stands, that every stride he makes upon my land is dangerous treason. He has come to open the purple testament of bleeding war. But ere the crown he looks for live in peace, 10,000 bloody crowns of mother's sons shall ill become the flower of England's face. Change the complexion of her maid pale peace to scarlet indignation and bedew her pastor's grass with faithful English blood. If you do this, there's going to be civil war. So Northumberland pipes up. <clears throat> the king of heaven forbid our lord the king should so with civil and uncivil arms be rushed upon. Thy thrice noble cousin Henry Bolingbroke doth humbly kiss thy hand, and by the, the honorable tomb he swears that stands upon your royal grandsire's bones, that's Edward III, and by the royalties of both your bloods, currents that spring from one most gracious head, and by the buried hand of warlike gaunt, and by the worth and honor of himself, comprising all that may be sworn or said, his coming hither hath no further scope than for his lineal royalties, and to beg enfranchisement immediate on his knees. He's only coming for his honest inheritance and freedom to come back to England from his banishment. Which on thy royal party granted once, you only have to grant that, his glittering arms he will commend to rust, his barbed steeds to stables, and his heart to faithful service of your majesty. This swears he as he is a prince and just, and as I am a gentleman, I credit him, I believe him. Now, the problem with this is even if Richard were a great king, you cannot accept these terms, can you? If you do, if I make you do this, and then I'll serve you loyally. No, something else will come up, and Henry Bolingbroke, who becomes Henry the Fourth, will find the same thing true in the very Northumberland, who's speaking for him here, and in his brother Worcester in the next play. So you cannot accept those terms if you're a king. You've got to have absolute loyalty, or else you're not the king. This guy's the king. You see? Because he put out this edict and now he has got to swallow it back. Or pull it, pull yes, he stole the money. Yeah. It, it, he's in the wrong. There's no question that he's in the wrong. But how can he remain king if he has to bow to the will of Bolingbroke? King says, Northumberland say thus, the king returns, his noble cousin is right welcome hither and all the number of his fair demands shall be accomplished without contradiction. With all the gracious utterance thou hast, speak to his gentle hearing kind commands. So he's making, he's being nice to him, right? He's making nice. And to Omeril next to him, he says, we do debase ourselves, cousin, do we not, to look so poorly and to speak so fair? Shall we call back Northumberland and send defiance to the traitor and so die? No, my good, no good, my lord, says Omeril. Let's fight with gentle words till time lend friends, and friends their helpful swords. Oh God, oh God, says Richard, that ere this tongue of mine that laid the sentence of dread banishment on yon proud man should take it off again with words of sooth. Oh, that I were as great as is my grief, or lesser than my name, or that I could forget what I have been, or not remember what I must be now. Swellest thou proud heart, he's talking to his own heart, I'll give thee scope to beat, since foes have scope to beat both thee and me. And Northumberland comes back from Bolingbroke, having carried those nice words, and the king doesn't wait for him to speak. He says, what must the king do now? Must he submit? The king shall do it. Must he be deposed? The king shall be contented. What? Who's talked of deposing? Bolingbroke hasn't said a word about it. Not Northumberland has said a word about it. Who's the first one who speaks of being deposed? He does. The king shall be contented. Must he lose the name of king? A god's name? Let it go. I'll give my jewels for a set of beads. 
That is, he'll go into a, a, a monastery. My gorgeous palace for a hermitage, my gay apparel for an almsman's gown, my figured goblets for a dish of wood. My, look how he's inventing himself, imagining himself. This is what he does. This is the sentimentalist Richard. He's just playing with this image of himself, feeling sorry for himself. My scepter for a palmer's walking staff, my subjects for a pair of carved saints, and my large kingdom for a little grave, a little, little grave, an obscure grave. Or I'll be buried in the king's highway, some way of common trade, where subjects' feet may hourly trample on their sovereign's head. For on my heart they tread now whilst I live, and buried once, why not upon my head? O Merle, thou weepst. My tender-hearted cousin, we'll make foul weather with despised tears. Our sighs and they shall lodge the summer corn and make a dearth in this revolting land. That is, our tears and our sighs will be like wind and rain destroying the crops. Or shall we play with the wantons with our woes and make some pretty match with shedding tears? As thus, now I'm coming up with a nice metaphor for our misery. To drop them still, meaning always, upon one place till they have fretted us a pair of graves within the earth. We're going to weep ourselves graves by the water dropping on the earth from their tears. And therein laid, there lies two kinsmen dig their graves with weeping eyes. Would, this, would not this ill do well? Well, well, I see, I talk but idly. Okay, he knows what he's doing. And you laugh at me. Most mighty prince, my lord Northumberland, what says King Bolingbroke? Will his majesty give Richard leave to live till Richard die? You make a leg, meaning he bows. And Bolingbroke says, I. So he's the one who's turning Bolingbroke into a king first in his imagination. All in irony, right? And he means it sarcastically. It's sarcastically. Northumberland says, my lord, in the base court, he doth attend to speak with you. May it please you to come down. Remember my idea of chiasmus? How the, so he's coming down. But he plays with it himself. Base court means the lower court, as opposed to the upper court in the building, in the castle. Uh, may it please you to come down. Down, down I come, like glistering phaeton, wanting the manage of unruly jades. What's the image? Who's phaeton? He wanted to find his father, and he finds him, and it turns out it's Apollo. And um, Apollo, his, Apollo has promised to give him a present. And he, uh, whatever he wants. And so he asks for a day to drive the chariots of the sun. And everybody says, you don't really want to do that. That's not a good idea. And he says, yes, yes, I have to prove that you're my father. And so Apollo has sworn. So he gives him the chariots, a uh, chariot of the sun. And he starts riding it. And he can't control them because he's not Apollo. And First, they go too high, and he burns a, spot, a streak across the sky, which is the Milky Way. And then he goes too low, and he burns a streak across the land, which is the Sahara Desert. And finally, Zeus says he's going to burn up the whole world. If, so he throws a thunderbolt and knocks him out of the sky. So Richard is thinking of Phaeton as wanting the manage of unruly jades. And in a sense, that's true. But it's because he has set the kingdom up in such a way that, the king, that he's refused to manage the kingdom. And therefore, he is going to crash and burn. And he knows it. I mean, he imagines it. In the base court, base court, where kings grow base to come at traitor's calls and do them grace. In the base court, come down. Down court, down king, for night owls shriek where mounting larks should sing. He exits. So Northumberland says, oh, he's speaking fondly like a frantic man. Bolingbroke says, stand all apart and show fair duty to his majesty. That is, kneel to him. And he kneels. And he says, my gracious lord. And Richard, now on the ground, 
with Bolingbroke in front of him on his knees, says, fair cousin, more irony, more sarcasm, fair cousin, you debase your princely knee to make the earth proud with kissing it. Me rather had my heart might feel your love than my unpleased eye see your courtesy. Up, cousin, up. Your heart is up, I know, thus high at least, although your knee be low. Now you're all virtuously looking at your text, so you didn't see what I did. So now look at me. <laughs> up, cousin, up. Your heart is up, I know, thus high at least, meaning aiming for the crown although your knee be low. Bolingbroke, my gracious Lord, I come but for mine own. Your own is yours, and I am yours, and all. So far be mine most, my most redoubted Lord, as my true service shall deserve your love. Well you deserve, they well deserve to have, that know the strongest and surest way to get. Deserve. Deserve, that's merit. Well, you deserve. Now, he's being ironical. But what we are seeing is, look, this guy's going to be a competent king. He, he's got people following him. He's, he knows how to uh, make things happen. Uncle, give me your hand. Nay, dry your eyes. This is York, who's weeping. Tears show their love, but want their remedies. I'm glad you're feeling sorry for me, but you don't have an army to fight for me. Cousin, I am too young to be your father. Cousin, now that's to Bolingbroke. I am too young to be your father, though you are old enough to be my heir. See the irony? What, will you, ha what you will have, I'll give, and willing to. For do we must what force will have us do. Set on towards London, cousin, is it so? Yea, my good lord. Then I must not say no. So now he's in their hands, and they're going to London. The next scene is one of those wonderful Shakespearean foil scenes, those bits where he has a, a completely different world, in this case, the garden uh, of the queen, Richard's queen. Um, the queen comes out with her lady, and they're not happy. They're miserable. And then they step aside to hear what the gardener says. So you, you will experience now Shakespeare building this great scene-long metaphor. Gardener says, line 29, Go bind thou up yon dangling apricocks, which like unruly children make their sire stoop with oppression of their prodigal weight. Okay, do you already get the parallel? <coughs> the sire is the tree and the fruit, the children are weighing it down. Give some supportance to the bending twigs. Go thou and like an executioner, cut off the heads of two fast growing sprays that look too loftly in our commonwealth. That's like uh, Bushy, Baggett, and Green, who've already been executed by Bolingbroke. You thus employed, I will go root away the noisome weeds, which without profit suck the soil's fertility from wholesome flowers. Anybody ever planted a garden and kept a garden in the room? Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. What do you have to do? Weed it. You have to weed it. You have to Trim it, you have to prune it, you have to weed it, you have to do all that stuff. Otherwise, what happens? Why should we, says the man, in his assistant, in the compass of a pail that is within a, a surrounding border, a wall, keep law and form and due proportion, showing as in a model our firm estate, when our sea-walled garden, that's England itself, which Gaunt had said, the sea is, serves as a wall, the whole land is full of weeds, her fairest flowers choked up, her fruit trees all unpruned, her hedges ruined, her knots disordered, and her wholesome herbs swarming with caterpillars. Remember that Bushy, Baggett, and Green were called the caterpillars of the realm. Hold thy peace, says the gardener. He that hath suffered this disordered spring hath now himself met with the fall of leaf. The weeds which his broad spreading leaves did shelter 
that seemed in eating him to hold him up are plucked up root and all by Bolinbrook. I mean the Earl of Wiltshire, bushy, green. What, are they dead? They are, and Bolingbrook hath seized the wasteful king. Wasteful king. Oh, what pity is it that he had not so trimmed and dressed his land as we this garden. In case you didn't get the message, he says it explicitly. We, at time of year, do wound the bark, the skin of our fruit trees, lest being over proud in sap and blood, with too much riches it confound itself. Had he done so to great and growing men, they might have lived to bear, and he to taste their fruits of duty. Superfluous branches we lop away, that bearing boughs may live. Had he done so, himself had borne the crown, which waste of idle hours hath quite thrown down. What, think you, the king shall be deposed? Depressed he is already, and deposed his doubt he will be. Doubt here means uh, doubtless. assuming, doubtless. Letters came last night to a dear friend of the good Duke of York's that tell black tidings. The queen bursts out. She can't stand it anymore. I am pressed to death through want of speaking. You know, that's one of the forms of torture in this period, pressing to death. You put somebody under a block of wood and you start piling stones on it. And the more they don't talk, the more you pile stones on until it's so heavy that they're crushed. Thou old Adam's likeness set to dress this garden. Why old Adam's likeness? Because Adam was the first gardener. How dares thy harsh, rude tongue sound this unpleasing news? What Eve, what serpent hath suggested thee, that's tempted thee, to make a second fall of cursed man? So remember, I began the whole series by talking about the deposing of Richard as the fall of man. And Shakespeare's making it literal and explicit in this uh, parallel with the garden. Why dost thou say King Richard is deposed? Darest thou, thou little better thing than earth, divine his downfall? Say where, when, and how camest thou by his, this ill tiding? Speak, thou wretch. And then he tells her... Um, and she's depressed more than before. Come, ladies, go to meet at London, London's king, and woe. Gardener, for telling me these news of woe, pray God the plants thou grafts may never grow. And she goes out, and he says, Poor queen, so that thy state might be no worse, I would my skill were subject to thy curse. If I could do anything about it by uh, the way I work the garden, I would do it. Here she did fall a tear, here in this place, I'll set a bank of rue, sour herb of grace. Rue, even for Ruth, here shortly shall be seen in the remembrance of a weeping queen. All right, 4-1. This is the great deposing scene. I'm not going to read all of it. The lords come in and they're discussing and debating. Um, There's a, there's a debate about who's loyal and who isn't, which exactly recapitulates the Bolingbroke Mowbray debate in the very beginning of the play. And now it's Bolingbroke trying to, um, to be the, the uh, umpire between them. So they're accusing each other of being disloyal to Bolingbroke as, and, or, and or disloyal to Richard. All right, so they call uh, Richard in. <clears throat> the, the Bishop of Carlisle's there. He's going to have a great speech in a minute. So York enters at line 107, act at 4, scene 1, line 107. And he says, great Duke of Lancaster, that's to Bolingbroke, I come to thee from plume-plucked Richard who with willing soul adopts the heir, and his high scepter yields to the possession of thy royal hand. So, legally speaking, Richard can do this. He can retire. He can renounce the kingship, um, abdicate in favor of Bolingbroke. And that's what he says he's willing to do. 
ascend his throne, descending now from him, and long live Henry, fourth of that name. That's York saying this. So now, because Richard has done this, York feels, okay, I'm following the king by accepting the deposing of Richard and going to proclaim Henry. But the bishop, and, uh, and Bolingbroke says, in God's name, I'll ascend the regal throne. Okay, I accept. It's dicey, isn't it? I mean, legally, based on right, Richard can do this. Morally speaking, he's been put in this impossible position. So what other choice does he have? On the other hand, he could wait till it's forced on him, but he doesn't. And Bolingbroke, who will make a much better king than Richard, says, I think it's probably better that I should be king than he. Okay. But Carlyle pipes up, Mary, God forbid. Worst in this royal presence may I speak, yet best beseeming me to speak the truth. Would God that any in this noble presence were enough noble to be upright judge of noble Richard. Then true noblesse would learn him forbearance from so foul a wrong. What subject can give sentence on his king? And who sits here that is not Richard's subject? Thieves are not judged, but they are by to hear, although apparent guilt be seen in them. And shall the figure of God's majesty, his captain, steward, deputy elect, anointed, crowned, planted many years, be judged by subject and inferior breath, and he himself not present? Oh, for fend it, God, that in a Christian climate, souls refined should show so heinous, black, obscene a deed. I speak to subjects, and a subject speaks, stirred up by God, thus boldly for his king. My lord of Hereford here, whom you call king, is a foul traitor to proud Hereford's king. Now, if he's not the king, then this is good what he's saying, right? He's a traitor, that's true. But if he is the king, then he's committing treason, calling it the king a traitor. So if, as Philip Thompson said once, uh, England's king is not its king, then what is England? Where is England? Who is the king? Okay. And if you crown him, that is, if you crown Bolingbroke, King Henry, let me prophesy, the blood of English shall manure the ground and future ages groan for this foul act. Peace shall go sleep with Turks and infidels, and in this seat of peace, tumultuous wars shall kin with kin and kind with kind confound. You hear all those K sounds? Disorder, horror, fear, and mutiny shall here inhabit, and this land be called the field of Golgotha and dead men's skulls. Oh, if you raise this house against this house, it will the woefulest division prove that ever fell upon this cursed earth. Prevent it, resist it, let it not be so, lest child, child's children cry against you, woe. <coughs> Pretty scary. And of course, the audience knows that it's true. It's exactly what happened. Northumberland. Well, have you argued, sir, and for your pains of capital treason, we arrest you here. My Lord of Westminster, be it your charge to keep him safely till his day of trial. So they arrest him for treason. Isn't that totally screwing up the hierarchy? I mean, what? You know, Is what to screwing well, up the hierarchy? For, uh, for Northumberland to be the one to say we're going to arrest him? Well, Northumberland's going to be made the, um, what is it, the Lord Chamberlain of the realm or something? No, that's true. <laughs> um, but he's showing his loyalty to Bolingbroke. But you're absolutely right. It's like, it's, the whole thing is completely dicey right. and, I mean, and very upsetting. And this is being played at a time when Queen Elizabeth doesn't have an announced heir. Right? She only announces the heir, James uh, the Sixth of Scotland, to be her heir at the very end of her life. So there's constantly talk about uh, who's going to be the heir to the throne. And 
they get, people get arrested and thrown in jail, and some of them are offed when they say the wrong thing about who's going to be there. You're not supposed to talk about it. Yes. Uh, and the not having the right to confront witnesses. That's right. That's English common law. It's old. Yes. Yeah, I have a question about what you said, too, because I thought when Carlisle says this, he's saying Richard should still, should still be king. He yeah. Says that. He is. So who is he? What happens to Carlisle? Well, right now he gets arrested. Well, that's what I thought. Let's, let's see what happens to him. But Well, he speaks out of being moved by loyalty to God. And remember that he's speaking out of that divine right of kings picture of the world. So yeah, that sounds fine. But here's Richard, who spent the last 15 years, or however many it is, you have to look it up, ruining England. And a whole lot of people want Bolingbroke to become king to save the country. So you got a pretty equal division between right and merit. It's a paradox, and it's horrible. All right, so fetch Richard hither, says Bolingbroke, that in common view he may surrender, so we shall proceed without suspicion. That'll take care of the Carlisles. York says, I will be his conduct. He goes out. Lords, you that here are under our arrest, procure your sureties for your days of answer. Little are we beholding to your love, and little looked for at your helping hands. You're, you're, you're going have, gonna to have to post bail. Okay, you haven't been helping your cause much. In comes Richard. Alack, says he, why am I sent for to a king before I have shook off the regal thoughts wherewith I reigned? Notice, regal thoughts. I hardly yet have learned to insinuate, flatter, bow, and bend my limbs. Give sorrow leave a while to tutor me to this submission. Yet I well remember the favors of these men. Were they not mine? Did they not sometime cry all hail to me? So Judas did to Christ. But he in twelve found truth in all but one. I in twelve thousand none. So who, to whom is he likening himself? No, to Christ. And I'm worse off. <laughs> he only had one traitor. I got 12,000. God save the king. Will no man say amen? Am I both priest and clerk? Well then, amen. God save the king, although I be not he. And yet amen, if heaven do think him me. To do what service am I sent for hither? York, to do that office of thine own good will, which tired majesty did make thee offer, the resignation of thy state and crown to Henry Bolingbroke. Give me the crown. Here, cousin, seize the crown. Here, cousin. On this side thy hand, and on that side yours. Now is this golden crown like a deep well that owes two buckets, filling one another, the emptier, the emptier ever dancing in the air, the other down unseen and full of water. You know how the well works. You crank it and the, the buckets reverse. Go down, get the water, come up, empty the bucket, and it goes down. That bucket down and full of tears am I, drinking my griefs, whilst you mount up on high. I thought you had been willing to resign. My crown I am, but still my griefs are mine. You may my glories and my state depose, but not my griefs. Still am I king of those. Still means always. Part of your cares you give me with your crown. Richard, your cares set up, do not pluck my cares down. Do you notice how up and down is a constant theme? <clears throat> my care is loss of care, by old care done. Your care is gain of care, by new care won. The cares I give, I have, though given away. They tend the crown, yet still with me they stay. 
Are you contented to resign the crown? I, no, no, I. For I must nothing be. Therefore, no, no, for I resign to thee. A Y, meaning yes, I, capital I. So what just happened? What's the rhetorical device? I told you last time. Chiasmus, chiasmus. So yes, no, no, yes. But it also means I, K-N-O-W, N-O, capital I. I know no I. I don't know myself. I am not myself. Why? For I must nothing be, therefore no, no. I can't say no, for I resign to thee. In other words, the, this is a pun. It's like almost, I don't know if it's triple or quadruple. You have to sit down and work it out. All the meanings of I and no in that chiasmus. But it's the crossover piece of the play. It's the X marks the spot where the fall of Richard and the rise of Bolingbroke cross. Because he's saying, yes, I'm content to resign the crown. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. So the no's are in the middle, and the yeses are at the beginning and the end. By the time he's done with this little trope, Bolingbroke is, has deposed him, or he has deposed himself. Now mark me how I will undo myself. I give this heavy weight from off my head and this unwieldy scepter from my hand, the pride of kingly sway, that means rule, from out my heart. With mine own tears I wash away my balm, that's the oil that anoints him king. With mine own hands I give away my crown. With mine own tongue deny my sacred state. With mine own breath release all duty's rights. All pomp and majesty I do forswear. My manners, rents, revenues I forgo. My acts, decrees, and statutes I deny. God pardon all oaths that are broke to me. God keep all vows unbroke that swear to thee. And this is why York in his sixes and sevens was not wrong to slowly drift to Bolingbroke. Because at this point, he, his loyalty has to go to the king. And Richard is now unmaking himself king and making Bolingbroke king. Uh, God keep all vows unbroke that swear to thee. Make me that nothing have with nothing grieved, and thou with all pleased that hast all achieved. Long mayest thou live in Richard's seat to sit. You see how he can't let it go? and soon lie Richard in an earthy pit. God save King Harry, unkinged Richard says, and send him many years of sunshine days. What more remains? Well, nothing from the point of view of right, but from the practical point of view, Northumberland has some suggestions. No more but that you read these accusations and these grievous crimes committed by your person and your followers against the state and prophet of this land, that by confessing them, the souls of men may deem that you are worthily deposed. Very practical, right? Must I do so? And must I ravel out my weaved up folly? Gentle Northumberland, if thy offenses were upon record, would it not shame thee in so fair a troop to read a lecture of them? If thou wouldst, there shouldst thou find one heinous article containing the deposing of a king and cracking the strong warrant of an oath, marked with a blot, damned in the book of heaven. Nay, all of you that stand and look upon them whilst that my wretchedness doth bait myself, though some of you with Pilate wash your hands, showing an outward pity, Yet you pilots have here delivered me to my sour cross, and water cannot wash away your sin. Northumberland, my lord, dispatch. Read o'er these articles. Now he's telling him what to do. Nasty. Northumberland's nasty. 
Mine eyes are full of tears I cannot see. And yet salt water blinds them not so much, but they can see a sort of traitors here. Nay, if I turn mine eyes upon myself, I find myself a traitor with the rest. True, but not fully in the sense that he's going to realize it later. He's, uh, he's deposed himself, but he hasn't realized why he had to be deposed. For I have given here my soul's consent to undeck the pompous body of a king, made glory base, and sovereignty a slave, proud majesty a subject, state a peasant. Northumberland, my lord, no lord of thine, thou hot, insulting man, nor no man's lord. I have no name, no title. No, not that name was given me at the font, but tis usurped. Alack, the heavy day that I have worn so many winters out and know not what name to call myself. Oh, that I were a mockery king of snow standing before the sun of Bolingbroke to melt myself away in water drops. Good king, who's, who's ringing? Okay. Oh, that I were a mockery king of snow standing before the sun of Bolingbroke to melt myself away in water drops. Good king, great king, and yet not greatly good. And if my word be sterling yet in England, let it command a mirror hither straight, that it may show me what a face I have, since it is bankrupt of his majesty. Go, some of you, and fetch a looking glass. Read o'er this paper while the glass doth come. Fiend, thou torments me ere I come to hell. Bolingbroke, urge it no more, my lord Northumberland. The commons will not then be satisfied. They shall be satisfied, says Richard. I'll read enough when I do see the very book indeed, where all my sins are writ, and that's myself. So he's going to play this metaphorical game. Forget all of your confession that you want me to sign and proclaim. I'm going to talk about my own image in the mirror. Give me the glass, and therein will I read no, de no deeper wrinkles yet. Has sorrow struck so many blows upon this face of mine and made no deeper wounds? Oh, flattering glass. Like to my followers in prosperity, thou dost beguile me. Was this face the face that every day under his household roof did keep 10,000 men? Was this the face that like the sun did make beholders wink? Was this the face that faced so many follies and was at last outfaced by Bullenbrook? He's not seeing in this face the moral choices or immoral choices that he's made. He's seeing the image. And a brittle glory shineth in this face, as brittle as the glory is the face. He smashes the mirror. For there it is, cracked in a hundred shivers. Mark, silent king, the moral of this sport. How soon my sorrow hath destroyed my face. Bolingbroke, the shadow of your sorrow hath destroyed the shadow of your face, meaning the image. It's just an image in the mirror. Say that again, says Richard. I'm going to play with this idea. The shadow of my sorrow. Ha, huh, let's see. Tis very true. My grief lies all within, and these external manners of laments are merely shadows to the unseen grief that swells with silence in the tortured soul. There lies the substance. And I thank thee, king, for thy great bounty that not only gives me cause to wail, but teaches me the way how to lament the cause. I'll beg one boon and then be gone and trouble you no more. Shall I obtain it? Name it, fair cousin. Fair cousin? I am greater than a king. For when I was a king, my flatterers were then but subjects. Being now a subject, I have a king here to my flatterer. Being so great, I have no need to beg, yet ask. And shall I have? You shall. Then give me leave to go. Whither? Whither you will, so I were from your sights. Go, some of you. Convey him to the tower. Oh, good. Convey? Conveyors are you all. That's another word for thieves. That rise thus nimbly by a true king's fall. 
All right, he goes out. On Wednesday next, we solemnly proclaim our coronation. Now, what immediately happens? Out he goes. Manet, Manent, remain the abbot of Westminster and the bishop of Carlisle and Omer. And what immediately happens? Abbot, a woeful pageant have we here beheld. Carlisle, the woes to come, the children yet unborn shall feel this day as sharp to them as thorn. You holy clergyman, is there no plot to rid the realm of this pernicious blot? Already plot against Bolingbroke, against the new king. Well, yes, there's going to be a plot. So Henry's going to have troubles. He's going to be a much better king than Richard. <clears throat> but there are people who are going to be rebelling against him. Yeah. So two things are sort of disturbing me about this. One is that um, there, there was the, the forcing of him, of Richard, to, uh, to uh, depose himself <coughs> feels so odd. I mean, that there's not a confrontation. There isn't, I mean. It's all by implication. Yes. So that seems. <coughs> Shakespeare is playing a very delicate game here. Well, yes, and that's the other thing is, like, what's the court thinking about this? They're divided, of course. They're divided. Some are going to plot against Bolingbroke. Some have gone over to... No, I mean, Jane. in the time. Elizabeth's uh, oh, in Elizabeth. Oh. I mean, well, I told you the story about doing the play later when, when it was, there was actually a rebellion mounted in London. Know you not that I am Richard, she said. But... When she saw this play, she got it. Like, I mean, you can't behave like Richard and expect to stay in power. And she is not like Richard. She, in that sense, she's got a very tight grip on everything that's going on. And the people she raises up are either loyal to her or are off with their heads. So it's, um, <clears throat> I don't think she thinks of it, or the court thinks of it as a threat when it's written and performed first, when it's pulled out of mothballs and re remounted, then it was tricky because it happened. They, they performed it on the day before this rebellion. But what's also sort of di disconcerting is it's almost a manipulation to get him to. It is, but it, that's the whole point. Bolingbroke is really good at manipulating. This is why he's going to be a competent king. Do you understand? He's got merit. He's a ruler. He's a leader. People follow him. They do what he says. You know, but manipulating has an element of... That's exactly right. And the thing is that it's both a, a horror that this happens and a necessity. And this is, makes it tragical, for, for Richard especially, because, because this it, it's so equally balanced between the force of Bolingbroke and the self-immolation of Richard. And it's not like one causes the other. They are, they, each is the mirror image of the other. And that is reflected in that I know no I moment, where they both got their hands on the crown, and the crown is passing from one to the other. Yeah. Well, Shakespeare would say, name one king, name one king that hasn't <laughs> had flatterers. But uh, they, weren't, they weren't eating up the realm because she, wouldn't, she wasn't letting that happen, which is why the prophecy of John of Gaunt is so powerful. You, you can't let England be treated that way. And she didn't. Remember, this is after the the uh, Spanish Armada, they're, they're triumphantly survived this invasion from Spain, and they're feeling their oats, Londoners and England and the court. All right, Act 5, Scene 1. I uh, just want to read Richard to Northumberland at line 55. The queen is trying to encourage him. 
and she, she talks about the deposing of a rightful king. And then Northumberland says, the mind of Bolingbroke has changed. You must to Pomfret, not unto the tower. And madam, there is order tained for you. With all swift speed, you must away to France. Um, do you remember in Richard III, the uncles of, the, of, of Edward V, who didn't survive to become Edward V, um, the two boys, uncles were killed at Pomfret. And one of the uncles said, Pomfret, Pomfret, remembering that Richard was imprisoned and killed there. <clears throat> so now we're reminded that he doesn't go to the tower, he goes to Pomfret. And she's, being, she's French, so she's being chased back to France. Richard says to Northumberland, Northumberland, thou ladder wherewithal the mounting Bolingbroke ascends my throne, the time shall not be many hours of age, more than it is, ere foul sin gathering head shall break into corruption. Thou shalt think, though he divide the realm and give thee half, it is too little, helping him to all. And he shall think that thou, which knowest the way to plant unrightful kings, wilt know again, being ne'er so little urged another way to pluck him headlong from the usurped throne. The love of wicked men converts, converts to fear, that fear to hate, and hate turns one or both to worthy danger and deserved death. And he's right. That's exactly what happens. Northumberland says, my guilt be on my head and there an end. So in the next play, we're going to see Northumberland and his brother Worcester and Hotspur plotting against the king with several other groups of people. So we'll talk about that when we get there. All right, he has to separate from his wife. Um, and then we get a scene 5-2 in which the Duke of York and the Duchess of York discover that Omeral is in a plot to overthrow Bolingbroke. Omeral was the cousin. He's also a first cousin. And he was the one that was standing with Richard all along. And now Richard is arrested or in custody and taken to Pomfret. And Omeral is plotting against Bolingbroke. So um, York discovers it by plucking this letter out of Omeral's uh, breast pocket and shouts treason, foul treason. Saddle my horse. He's going to ride to Bolingbroke to appeach, meaning accuse his son or stepson of treason. Hence, villain, never more come in my sight. Give me my boots, I say. <clears throat> That's uh, Act 5, Scene 2, line 90, 89, 88. She says, the Duchess, why, York, what wilt thou do? Wilt thou not hide the trespass of thine own? Have we more sons, or are we like to have? Is not my teeming date drunk up with time? And wilt thou pluck my fair son from mine age and rob me of a happy mother's name? Is he not like thee? Is he not thine own? Thou fond mad woman, she wants him to cover it up. Wilt thou conceal this dark conspiracy? A dozen of them here obtained the sacrament and interchangeably set down their hands to kill the king at Oxford. He shall be none. We'll keep him here. Then what's that to him? Then what is that to him? Away, fond woman, were he 20 times my son, I would appeach him. That's a cues. He chases her out, and she says, uh, and he leaves. And uh, uh, she says to her son, O'Merle, mount thee upon his horse, spur post, and get before him to the king. Rush to the king and say you're sorry, and I'm going to come behind you. I'm his aunt. I can plead for you. Uh, now we see King Henry for the first time as king. And what's the first thing he says? Can no man tell me of my unthrifty son? Wait a minute. I went through all this, deposed the king, have to do all this manipulating of England to convince them that I'm the rightful king now, 
and my son is behaving like Richard, unthrifty? Ugh. Tis full three months since I did see him last. If any plague hang o'er over us, tis he. I would to God, my lords, he might be found. Inquire at London amongst the taverns there. Oh boy, are we going to have fun with those taverns later. For there they say he daily doth frequent with unrestrained loose companions. Even such they say as stand in narrow lanes and beat our watch and rob our passengers, thieves in other words which he, young wanton and effeminate boy, takes on the point of honor to support so dissolute a crew. All right, now, one of my great complaints about people teaching this, these plays and scholars is they take this for true about Prince Hal. In other words, they think of him as dissolute. In the histories, he was, apparently. But in Shakespeare, no, it's not real. It's a pose for a purpose, which we'll see next Thursday. In the meantime, my lord, some two days since I saw the prince and told him of those triumphs held at Oxford. What said the gallant? His answer was he would unto the stews, that is the brothels of London, and from the commonest creature pluck a glove and wear it as a favor. And with that, he would unhorse the lustiest challenger. So Prince Hal is being flippant and insulting. As dissolute as desperate, he says, the king says. Yet through both I see some sparks of better hope. Aha! Which elder years may happily bring forth. Maybe he'll grow up. I, I see some sparks of nobility in it. I'm, that was the end of 5.3, sorry. It's not the end of 5.3, it's the beginning of 5.3. And O'Merle comes in, where's the king? What means our cousin that he stares and looks so wildly? God save your grace, I do beseech your majesty to have some conference with your grace alone. Withdraw yourselves and leave us here alone. What is the matter with our cousin? Now this is unusual, the king to be alone, but it's his cousin and he's thrown himself on his knees and says he wants to talk to him. He kneels, my tongue cleave to the roof within my mouth unless a pardon ere I rise or speak. I want you to pardon me. Intended or committed was this fault. If on the first, how heinous ere it be, to win thy after love, I pardon thee. If it's only a planned fault, I forgive you, to win your love. If, it's, if you already committed it, I need to know what it is. Then give me leave that I may turn the key that no man enter till my tale be done. Have thy desire. Omer locks the door. The Duke of York arrives, knocks on the door. My liege, beware, look to thyself, thou hast a traitor in thy presence there. Villain, I'll make thee safe, he draws. He believes York immediately, pulls his sword. Stay thy revengeful hand, thou hast no cause to fear. York, open the door, secure fool howardy king, he's calling him names. Shall I for love speak treason to thy face? Open the door or I will break it open. He opens the door. What is the matter, uncle? Speak, recover breath, tell us how near is danger that we may arm us to encounter it. Peruse this writing here and thou shalt know the treason that my haste forbids me show. So he reads the letter. O oh, heinous, strong and bold conspiracy, line 60. O oh, loyal father of a treacherous son, thou sheer immaculate and silver fountain from whence this stream through muddy passages hath held his current and defiled himself. So we're talking about fathers and sons, right? It's a parallel. We just heard him complaining about his own son. Now he's got this O'Merle example. And look at York. York totally loyal to him. We, we can't accuse York of disloyalty even though he left Richard to serve Bolingbroke. Duchess, what ho, my liege, for God's sake, let me in. Now she comes in screaming. Uh, woman and thy aunt, great king, tis I, speak with me, pity me, open the door. A beggar begs that never begged before. She's a duchess. Our scene is altered from a serious thing and now is changed to the beggar and the king. My dangerous cousin, let your mother in. I know she has come to pray for your foul sin. Notice rhymed couplets. If thou do pardon whatsoever, whatsoever pray, sorry, if thou do pardon whosoever pray, more sins for this forgiveness prosper may. 
this festered joint cut off, the rest, the rest rests sound. This let alone will all the rest confound. This is basically justice and mercy, right? York is saying you've got to kill him because he sets an example to the others, to future uh, rebels and tra traitors. And the queen, I mean, the duchess is saying, save him, save him, he's my son, he's your cousin, he doesn't mean it, he's not going to do it. All right, so they go back and forth. Good aunt, stand up. No, she's not going to stand up till he says pardon. I pardon him as God shall pardon me, line 131 or so. I pardon him as God shall pardon me. He needs to be pardoned, too, because he's deposed a king himself. <sighs> oh, happy vantage of a kneeling knee, yet am I sick for fear. Speak it again. Twice saying pardon doth not pardon twain, but makes one pardon strong. With all my heart I pardon him. A god on earth thou art. Still rhymed couplets. But for our trusty brother-in-law and the abbot, with all the rest of that consorted crew, destruction straight shall dog them at the heels. Good uncle helped to order several powers. Now there's going to be a war. The first war after the deposing of Richard. The first civil war. All right, scene four. Very short. Sir Piers of Exton enters. Didst thou not mark the king what words he spake? Quote, have I no friend will rid me of this living fear? Was it not so? These were his very words. Have I no friend, quoth he, he spake it twice and urged it twice together. Did he not? He did. And speaking it, he wishedly looked on me as who should say, I would thou wert the man that would divorce this terror from my heart. Meaning the king at Pomfret. Come, let's go. I am the king's friend and will rid his foe. So he, by intuition, gathers what Bolingbroke, what Henry means, and he's going to go to Pomfret and kill Richard. Why does Richard need to be killed? Why is it a, a, um, a terror in his heart, a living fear? Because as long as he's alive, there can be a rebellion in his favor and try to put him back on the, on the throne. All right, now take a deep breath. We enter into the prison cell at Pomfret, and Richard is alone. And he has a long soliloquy. I have a particular affection for this soliloquy because when I was a young whippersnapper teaching Shakespeare with my professor for the first time, he said one day, we were teaching this play, um, I don't have anything to say about the soliloquy, so you talk about it next, next time we meet. <laughs> okay, I mean, we'd been sitting there together, team teaching the course and talking together and supporting whatever, each other. I was learning how to teach, um, or trying to. And I thought, oh boy, I better go home and study this pretty well. And I went home and studied it pretty well. And it hit me what was happening here. Um, and it became the first chapter of my dissertation, which was called, with way too much alliteration, Some Special Uses of the Soliloquy in Shakespeare. <laughs> and the thesis was that in each of the great plays where we know these great soliloquies, Shakespeare molded the form of the soliloquy to fit the dramatic moment and made it not just a report, but a drama. And that only grew and became more and more um, interwoven with Shakespeare's dramatic art as he matured. So here's Richard alone. <clears throat> I have been studying how I may compare this prison where I live unto the world. And for because the world is populous, and here is not a creature but myself, I cannot do it. Now, he's had a whole career of using images to talk to about himself, right? But he's stuck. Yet I'll hammer it out, I'll work it out, I'll make it work. 
My brain, I'll prove the female to my soul, my soul the father, and these two beget a generation of still breeding thoughts. So my soul and my brain are going to beget a generation, an offspring of thoughts. Carolyn, are you all right? I have a problem. That's all right. I want to make sure you're okay. And these same thoughts people this little world. I'm going to people this little world of the prison cell with thoughts. In humors like the people of this world, for no thought is contented. The better sort, as thoughts of things divine, are intermixed with scruples and do set the word itself against the word, as thus, come little ones, and then again, it is as hard to come as for a camel to thread the postern of a small needle's eye. What's he talking about? What does it mean to set the word against the word? He's talking about the gospel. So Jesus says, suffer the little ones to come unto me. And he also says, it's as hard uh, for a rich man to get into heaven as a camel to thread through the needle's eye. So they don't serve these thoughts of things divine. They're, they contradict each other. We are in paradox. Then, uh, thoughts tending to ambition, they do plot unlikely wonders. How these vain weak nails, he means his fingernails, may tear a passage through the flinty ribs of this hard world, my ragged prison walls. And for they cannot die in their own pride. So he, the ambition to get out, scratching himself out of these walls, and yet he can't do it. And so that ambition has to die. Thoughts tending to content flatter themselves that they are not the first of fortune slaves, nor shall not be the last. Like silly beggars who, sitting in the stocks, refuge their shame that many have and others must sit there. And in this thought they find a kind of ease, bearing their own misfortunes on the back of such as have before endured the like. That is, people who are in the stocks, people who have sunk to a low condition, we can think of Kent later on in King Lear, refuge their shame, they, they find a refuge in their shame with the thought that others have had to suffer like uh, misfortunes. Thus play I in one person many people and none contented. Not content with thoughts of things divine, not content with thoughts of ambition, not content with, con with being content itself. Sometimes am I king, then treasons make me wish myself a beggar, and so I am. Then crushing penury persuades me I was better when a king. Then am I king to gain, and by and by think that I am unkinged by Bolinbrook, and straight am nothing. But whate'er I be, nor I nor any man that but man is, with nothing shall be pleased till he be eased with being nothing. No one can be content. I cannot be content. Until I am nothing, I can't be pleased with having nothing. And then he hears music. Music do I hear? Ha! <laughs> Keep time. How sour sweet music is when time is broke and nor, no proportion kept. The guy who's playing music for him outside the prison wall can't play very well. It's bad music. Then he says, so is it in the music of men's lives. And here have I the daintiness of ear to check time broke in a disordered string. But for the concord of my state and time, had not an ear to hear my true time broke. That is, in the music of his governing England, he didn't have the ear to hear the true time broken, as he can hear the time false in the music that's being played. I wasted time, and now doth time waste me. 
What's the figure of speech? I wasted time, and now doth time waste me. Chiasmus again. And it's a breakthrough. For now hath time made me his numbering clock. Now we're going to have an elaborate metaphor again. My thoughts are minutes, and with sighs they jar their watches on unto mine eyes, the outward watch, where to my finger like a dial's point is pointing still and cleansing them from tears. So he's the clock. Now, sir, the sound that tells what hour it is, that is the, the ringing of the bell of the clock, are clamorous groans which strike upon my heart, which is the bell. So the hands of the clock are my fingers wiping away tears, and the gong of the clock is my groans. So sighs and tears and groans show minutes, times, and hours. But my time runs posting on in Bolingbroke's proud joy while I stand fooling here, his jack of the clock. This music mads me. Let it sound no more. For though it have hope madmen to their wits, that is, music has power to heal, in me it seems it will make wise men mad. Yet, blessing on his heart that gives it me, for tis a sign of love, and love to Richard, is a strange brooch in this all-hating world. Now, this is a breakthrough. Why? What's the breakthrough? What's different? It's not just the music that's a gift to Richard. It's its bad time. The fact that it's bad timing is not intended by the musician, of course, but it, is, it causes him to think and recognize his own faults and failure. And at the end of this, he says a blessing on the giver of this music. He's caring for the first time about someone besides himself. Do you see this? Everything I've been reading to you from him is about me, 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 my image, my crown, my I'm the son, I'm Christ, I'm, it's all me. And suddenly blessing on his heart that gives it me, for it is a sign of love. And love to Richard is a strange brooch in this all-hating world. So that's a breakthrough. Now, what are the consequences of this? Enter a groom of the stable. Groom, hail royal prince Richard, thanks, noble peer. The cheapest of us is ten groats too dear. All right, the, the, we're talking about coins here, right? Um, the royal is a coin worth, a coin worth ten shillings, and a noble is six shillings eightpence. The difference is ten groats. A groat being fourpence. So he says, royal prince, and Richard takes it as a reference to the coin, which he doesn't mean, of course. And then he says, noble peer, the cheapest of us is ten groats too dear. <clears throat> what are, I, I don't deserve to be any richer a coin than you are, because I'm nothing. Um, what art thou? And how comest thou hither, where no man never comes but that sad dog that brings me food to make misfortune live? Groom. I was a poor groom of thy stable, king, when thou wert king, who traveling towards York with much ado at length have gotten leave to look upon my sometimes royal master's face. Oh, how it earned my heart, earned means sorrowed, my heart, when I beheld in London streets that coronation day, when Bolingbroke rode on Roan Barbary, that horse that thou so often hast bestrid, that horse that I so carefully have dressed. Rode he on Barbary? Tell me, gentle friend, how went he under him? How did the horse go under Bolingbroke? So proudly as if he disdained the ground. So proudly as if he disdained the ground. So proud that Bolingbroke was on his back. That jade, now he's insulting the horse, old tired out horse. That jade hath had bread from my royal hand. This hand hath made him proud with clapping him, petting him. Would he not stumble? Would he not fall down, since pride must have a fall, and break the neck of that proud man that did usurp his back? 
humility doesn't last very long. And uh, it's characteristic. We've heard this before. Where are the spiders coming out to bite the heels of the, of the enemy troops? Where I'm going to come out like the sun, and they're going to run away, all that. Fantasy. But suddenly now, he says something else. Forgiveness, horse. Why do I rail on thee, since thou, created to be awed by man, was born to bear? I was not made a horse, and yet I bear a burden like an ass, spurred, galled, and tired by Johnson Bullenbrook. Keeper comes in. Fellow, give place. Here is no longer stay. Richard, if, you, if thou love me, tis time thou wert away. What my tongue dares not, that my heart shall say. So out goes the loyal lover of Richard. And the keeper comes in and says, will it please you fall too, meaning eat. Richard, taste of it first, as thou art wont to do. Taste of it first, as you're used to doing. Keeper, my lord, I dare not. Sir Pierce of Exton, who lately came from the king, commands the contrary. Give this to him to eat, but don't taste it. The devil take Henry of Lancaster and thee. Patience is stale, and I'm weary of it. And he beats him out of the room. That's the first time Richard has done anything. He said a whole lot. It's the first time he's done any action. Help, 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 the keeper says. Enter Sext uh, Pierce of Exton, murderers. How now, says Richard, what means death in this rude assault? Villain, thy own hand yields thy death's instrument. He snatches a weapon from the servant, or the murderer, and kills him. Go thou and find another room in hell. He kills another one. All of a sudden, this grandson of Edward III and the son of Edward the Black Prince, great fighters, is a fighter. And he's fighting for something for the first time. And then Pierce of Exton hits him from behind, or strikes him down. And he says, that hand shall burn in never quenching fire that staggers thus my person. That is, you'll be damned for this. Exton, thy fierce hand hath with the king's blood stained the king's own land. Mount, mount, my soul, thy seat is up on high whilst my gross flesh sinks downward here to die. And Pierce of Exton says, as full of valor as of royal blood. All right, what just happened? Richard is some degree penitent. I wasted time and now doth time waste me. And he is blessing on his heart that gives it me. And then they come to kill him, and he fights. And then, as he's dying, that rising and falling imagery that we've had all through the play, up, down, down, up, is in the final analysis a rising of his soul. Mount, mount my soul, thy seat, that is the throne of the soul, is up on high whilst my gross flesh sinks downward here to die. And Pierce of Exton says, as full of valor as of royal blood. Now what's royal blood? Right. And what's valor? Merit. Merit. So at the end of his life, at the very end, having had this soliloquy of revelation, through his imagination working on what's coming to him, including responding to something that comes from the outside, an act of grace from the outside. And the grace, not just in the music, which is the normal vehicle of our feeling of grace, but in its broken time, in its erroneous playing, that makes him aware of his own erroneous playing of the music of his life. And when they come to kill him, he says, no, enough of that. And he fights. Of course, it's not enough. He can't live. And, he's, and uh, 
three against one, at least three against one. But mount, mount my soul, thy seed is up on high, whilst my gross flesh sinks downward here to die. And Pierce of Exton gives the epitaph as full of valor as of royal blood. In the end, in his final action, he has redeemed this meritlessness, which he ignored because he rested only on right, and he has earned this epithet of valor, of merit, of courage. And so he's united them in his last moment. He's united right and merit. Then Exton says, both have I spilled. Oh, would the deed were good. For now the devil that told me I did well says that this deed is chronicled in hell. This dead king to the living king I'll bear. Take hence the rest and give them burial here. So they're going to bury the guys that Richard killed, and then he's going to take Richard's body to Henry. Now what's happening with Henry, the last scene of the play? King, kind Uncle York, the latest news we hear is that the rebels have consumed with fire our town of Sis Sister in Gloucestershire. But whether they be tain or slay me here, not enter Northumberland, welcome, my lord, what news? First to thy sacred state wish I all happiness. The next news is I have to London sent the heads of Oxford, Salisbury, Blunt, and Kent. These are all rebels against Bolingbroke, or against Henry. The manner of their taking may appear at large discourse in this paper here. We thank thee, gentle Percy, for thy pains, and to thy worth will add right worthy gains. We're going to reward you. Brocus, Sir Bennet Seeley, other people killed. Um, the grand conspirator, abbot of Westminster, with clog of conscience and sour melancholy, hath yielded up his body to the grave. But here is Carlisle living, so abide thy kingdom doom and sentence of his, to abide thy kingdom, kingly doom and sentence of his pride. Here's the king, there's uh, Carlisle. Now remember, Carlisle's the one who prophesied disaster if you depose Richard. And the king says, okay, Bolingbroke now, Henry, not Richard. How's he going to behave? Carlisle, this is your doom. Choose out some secret place, some reverend room, more than thou hast, and with it joy thy life. So as thou livest in peace, die free from strife. For though mine enemy thou hast ever been, high sparks of honor in thee have I seen. Pretty good, yeah? You were on Richard's side, but you were doing it because of loyalty. I see you as honorable. It was a tough time. And you couldn't do, be on either side and be doing the right thing entirely. So he gets to live. They take him away. Exton comes in with the coffin of Richard II. Great king, within this coffin I present thy buried fear. Herein all breathless lies the mightiest of thy great at greatest enemies, Richard of Bordeaux, by me hither brought. Exton, I thank thee not, for thou hast wrought a deed of slander with thy fatal hand upon my head and all this famous land. From your own mouth, my lord, did I this deed. They love not poison that do poison need nor do I thee. Queen Elizabeth had several powerful men who were spies and lords and, you know, the secret police of the time. And they had great quantities of blood on their hands. So it's a little bit um, daring for Shakespeare to have the king say this. They love not poison that do poison need nor do I thee. Though I did wish him dead, I hate the murderer, love him murdered. You know, there was a whole story about Elizabeth's sister and cousin. The guilt of conscience take thou for thy labor, but neither my good word nor princely favor. With Cain go wander thorough shades of night and never show thy head by day nor light. Lords, I protest my soul is full of woe, that blood should sprinkle me to make me grow. Come, mourn with me for what I do lament, 
and put on sullen black incontinent. Quit, that means immediately. I'll make a voyage to the Holy Land to wash this blood off from my guilty hand. That is a pilgrimage. And of course, he all through the plays, as long as he's alive, he's promising to go to the Holy Land on pilgrimage to wipe away this guilt, and he never gets there. Yeah, I guess it just jumped to me this the second time, but it, that line, I hate the murderer, love the murder, it seems the, the opposite of the biblical injunction, uh, you know, love the sinner, hate, hate the, the sinner, the sin, basically yeah. saying, love the sin and hate the sinner. Uh, no, what he's saying is, I wanted him dead, but my relation to him was that I, I would never kill him. I couldn't kill him. I didn't want to well, kill I, him. I get that, but I mean, the very line itself is basically saying, I hate the murderer. What I'm saying is the sinner, but I love the fact that he murdered him. I love the sin that he did. Um, I think he's not, uh, maybe. I mean, uh, there may be an echo of that, but I think he's not talking about the sin versus the sinner. He's talking about the two people the murdered and the murderer. He wanted him dead, but he doesn't love the person who killed him. I mean, there may be an echo of what you're saying, but I think he doesn't mean it because it's not in his character to talk like that so much. Maybe, you could argue with me, we'll see. I have to think about it. Um, I'll make a voyage to the Holy Land to wash this blood off from my guilty hand. March sadly after, grace my mornings here and weeping after this untimely beer. Okay, so, What's the opposite uh, at the end? We have this, <laughs> we have the union of right and merit in Richard at the last moment, right? And now we have this division within Henry. I hate the murderer. I love him murdered. That's paradoxical. I've got these rebels on my hands. So I've got merit as a king, but I'm still having to fight the way Richard, the rightful king, had to fight or resist or fail to resist. And I've got this unthrifty son who's terrifying me about the future because what kind of king is he going to make when he inherits the throne? So the, the chiasmus that goes like this, Richard downward and Bolingbroke upward and crossing it I know no I, at the end of the play, they cross again and Richard goes up and Henry is in trouble and sorrow, and he's going to face rebels all of his reign, all through his reign, because of this questionable way he took. Now, he's a much better king, and England is not being farmed out, and so on. So it's, there's, there's the justification of his doing this never goes away, but he doesn't get off saying, oh, I'm the meritorious one, so it'll all be okay. No, it won't. Carlyle's prophecy comes true, and there will have be a hundred years of wars because of it. Okay, so we have a lot of good time to ask me questions about this play or about the histories generally, um, and then we'll start Henry the Fourth, Part One, on Thursday. Questions, comments. It's a highly rhetorical play. Yes. Um, because, yeah, that's true. Um, let me see if I can give you a historical answer to this question. Yes. She, we know she's French. Okay, let's see. Richard. Not on your sheet, no. Hold on. Richard is married to Isabella, the seven-year-old daughter, in, in 1396. So he, he dies in 1400. Um, so he's married to Isabella, a seven-year-old daughter of Charles VI, sealing a supposedly 25-year truce with the French. After Richard's death, she will marry Charles d'Orléans, 
Henry V will marry her sister Catherine in the end of Henry V. So she's, she's, Ansel seven, years old, she's seven years old, yeah. Mm -hmm. So Shakespeare's inventing the character, essentially, of the queen sorrowing for her husband. She was just a girl in, historically. Anyway, so that's. Oh, yes, effeminate, you mean. So, I mean, is this another insult? Well, what is it about, what does effeminate mean there? Weak. It doesn't mean weak. It doesn't mean that women can't be strong. It means that men's role is fighting, warfare, right? Government. Women's role is not. When Lady Macbeth says, unsex me here, She's talking about getting rid of the compassion in her heart. And we've seen a great, powerful version of that in the Duchess of York. You know, it's not that women are weak, it's that they have a different function in the world and a different, a different. But the Duchess then goes against the brain with that power. The she no, does. she goes into the king and she says, I'm not getting off my knees until you forgive him. And he forgives him. I know. She's using her power, which just proves to you that not all women are weak and powerless. Thank you. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. It's just the calumny that all women have been oppressed and weak and miserable and... That's ridiculous. I mean, there are oppressed and weak women. There are oppressed and weak men. There are plenty of men who have been oppressed and weakened by women in history, if you study the details. But, the reason he, mean, he says effeminate is that he's hanging out in East Cheap with women and drunks and thieves and not playing the role of the prince of the realm, not playing the role of a nobleman and a fighter. That's, that's the, the root of the insult. It's not that, he, that, that women are, I mean, what can I say? Women aren't supposed to be fighters. You know all these movies where the women are Wonder Woman and yes. they're coming out fighting and guns and Star Wars. And it's just nonsense. It's just nonsense. <laughs> Utter nonsense. Anyway, let's not get into that because I'll be lynched. There are more of us here tonight. <laughs> Ask me questions. Yes. He gets upset because he says you're a duchess, you shouldn't be here, not being you. Right. And also his aunt. Also his wife. His aunt. Oh, his aunt. Right? The wife of his uncle. Mm -hmm. And it's unseemly for her, yeah. her to be. And it shows how strong she is in determination to save her son. And it works. Omeral? Yeah. Because he was a first cousin, another first cousin of the king, mm -hmm. and he, the king liked him and took care of him, and he was one of the people who was benefiting from Richard's... He didn't like the transition. No. <clears throat> he didn't like the idea of his cousin king being overthrown, and he was part of that crowd that was, you know, supporting Richard in his depravities. So he's young, and he has to grow up, but... He's, he, he's, you can think of him as a foil for Northumberland. Omeral and Northumberland are both lords of the realm. Northumberland rushes first thing to Bolingbroke. Says, I'm with you, I'm with you. Whatever you want to do, I'll help you get your stuff back. And then later, if you want to be king, great. And Omeral is the opposite. He stays with Richard and stays and stays and stays to the point where he's plotting against Henry. And then when he's discovered, he goes over. And between them York. is York. Slowly and deliberately and carefully, not trying to betray Richard, not trying to betray Henry, and he makes that transition. York is a great character, a profound drawing of the, of the agony of a good man faced with this impossible choice. And it's tearing England apart. 
now in this play. And it, England stays torn apart until Richard III is killed. And then Henry VII puts it, according to Shakespeare's view, of course, puts it back together again. You have Wright and Merritt united, you have York and Lancaster united, and then you have a succession. And one of the reasons these plays were so powerful and so scary, not just that they'd come through a hundred years of civil war, but as I said, Elizabeth doesn't have an heir. It's not clear who's going to be the next king. And is she going to marry a Catholic? Is she going to marry a Protestant? Is she not going to marry at all? Can she even have children? By this time, she's quite old. So it's, it's uh, everybody's on pins and needles. Everybody's terrified what's going to happen. We don't want to go back into a civil war. What if, what if you know, who, Essex comes forward and all the pretenders from generations back. Henry VIII had pretty successfully killed all the possible uh, descendants of the original Edward III, so there wasn't really anybody to claim, but it was still unsettling. So this threat of civil war was a real, was a live issue. Um, and Shakespeare is dramatizing the importance of both these aspects of kingship, both the right and the merit, to keep the thing together and keep it from splitting into this hundred years of civil war. Yeah? I, I, I find in the very ending of this play, it, it seems to me to reverberate with the part of the soliloquy that you just cited of the, the lament of uh, how he, uh, Richard was so disconsolate that he wished to be a beggar rather than a king, and the grief that is driving uh, the voyage to the Holy Land for a cleansing seems to me very, very similar sensibility to that that Richard was just expressing in his soliloquy. Yeah, it's, um, you can't win in this play. You can't win. When Richard discovers that he is responsible for this mess, He's miserable, and it, and it takes a attack, direct attack for him to kind of rise to the occasion and actually do something. It's the only thing Richard's ever actually done about preserving his kingship. He sold the land, he's stolen the money from people, he's ignored the danger of Bolingbroke and Mowbray. Um, sorry? He's gone off to Ireland in a frivolous pursuit. Nothing came of that, by the way. They lost. So it's the first time at the end when he feels remorse and responsibility that he's moved to actually do something. And he protects the king from being killed twice and then fails to do so, and he gets killed. Um, and Henry saved England by taking the throne. But it's, it's a questionable maneuver because of the right problem. He's perfectly good at mounting armies and keeping himself on the throne. He's perfectly good at running England in a decent way. He's not going to steal the Lord's monies from them. In fact, he's giving them gifts in thanks for loyalty. But there's this guilt on his head, which he carries with him for the rest of his life. And in Henry the Fourth part two, when he's speaking to Prince, ha well, in part one and part two, two, several times, he speaks to his son um, about how he came by the throne, urging him not to behave like Richard and to make sure he makes, gets the people to like him. What's ironic is he doesn't realize that Prince Hal's plan is that the lords are going to like him when he comes out of East Cheap and shows who he really is. But he's got to get the rest of England to like him and, and um, defeat the rebels, which he does. But we'll talk about that in, when we get to that play. The point is that, that Henry um, is divided. Richard's divided against himself. Henry's divided against himself, but in mirror image ways. So Richard is right, sits on right, but doesn't care about earning that right with merit. And Bolingbroke 
earns the right, earns the merit, but he, there's nothing he can do to get the right. I mean, he's got Richard to depose himself, and he's got Northumberland to get him to sign papers and all that. It doesn't work because people are still plotting over there to overthrow him. So the, the merit isn't enough, and the right isn't enough. The king has this very heavy-duty job under God to rule England. And he's got to rule it rightly, and he's got to rule it meritoriously. If he doesn't have both, forget it. You're going to have trouble, endless trouble. Now, what this sets going is corruption, not immediately, but it develops more and more corrupt. So after Henry V dies, who's the great ideal king for Shakespeare, his son becomes king at the age of nine months. So the, king is, the kingdom is run by uncles. And then they start jockeying with each other, the French versus the English and the Yorks versus the Lancasters. And eventually, you have all these people fighting each other and killing each other. And it's all recorded in the Henry VI plays. Uh, and it ends with Richard knocking off everybody between himself and the crown, becoming the worst of all of them. Like he's got neither right nor merit. He is kind of the antichrist. He's the vice of kings. He's, um, in a sense, the scourge of God, cleansing England of all of these corrupt families and practices uh, until he's finally extirpated and defeated. And then you can have stability, harmony, right and merit together. Um, and that's the Tudor doctrine of the Tudor dynasty, that Henry VII wedded the two houses and put an end to the strife. And of course, it, it uh, helped that he and his son then killed off all the possible pretenders to the throne. But they did, and there were no pretenders then. Who was Henry the first and started the Henrys? Oh, that's way far back, way far back. I don't, I don't have the history at hand of that. It's hundreds of years earlier. Yes? So we, uh, at the beginning of the play, the Mowbray and Bolingbroke are, seem like they're, they're going to dominate the, the play. And then Mowbray just goes off and dies. Yeah, later we hear he's died. And <laughs> but it's just like, what happened? So <laughs> what's happened, at the, at the end of the play, you can see these lords coming in and out in Northumberland, talking in a haughty way and, and executing these rebels and so on. What's, wh that's also a contrast. That's a kind of image of the chaos that began with orderliness. Even when you have Bolingbroke and Mowbray accusing each other of treachery to the king, um, you have that contained within the old medieval order of the kingdom. And Richard still thought of as the authority. And he, he sets up this trial by combat or, to, to figure out, let God figure out who's the bad guy, who's the good guy here. They're both questionable. Um, Mowbray has been involved in the plot to execute Richard's uncle, the other uncle, Gloucester. And, and Bolingbroke knows this probably from his father. Um, but the point is that, that as long as Richard is on the throne, in the, or rather in the beginning of the play, there's this order to the kingdom. It's the old order. It's the old dynastic uh, divine right of kings order. By the end of the play, we've got nothing but mess. Richard's a mess, then he dies, and then Henry's a mess for other re opposite reason. Um, and when he dies, his son tries to put it all together, and it's too little. It's, it's, there's 10 years of where it works, and then he dies. He dies young, and his son becomes king, and then the chaos erupts and it all falls apart. And it's finally purged by Richard III. Um, and it's 100 years later. It's 100 years after this. 
So Mowbray wasn't really needed in, in a dramatic sense. No, Mowbray. He done his bit. Uh, yeah, he did, he himself. played his role of it's it's the difference between conflict between peers in the beginning of things and conflict between peers or among peers when this upending, this overthrow has taken place. But I remind you that the overthrow of Richard is caused by Richard. That is, it's his self-indulgence and immorality that has invited this overthrow. Um, and it's tragic because the, he won't listen to reason. He won't listen to John of Gaunt's reason. And it's so equally opposite. It's so equally posed by Shakespeare. You just can't take sides. I mean, it's, it's, there's wrongness on both sides. So why did he even let Bolingbroke come back? Because the six years hadn't passed or had No, he couldn't stop him. He was in Ireland with his soldiers and Bolingbroke lands and gathers people to him like Northumberland who run to him to support him to get Lancaster back. Because remember Richard had stolen it from, yeah. from after John of Gaunt died. So Richard took it over and he wants it back. He broke the, the law by coming back, but he justified it. Look, if Richard is the law, that's fine. He can banish me. But if he steals my property, that goes against a different kind of law. It doesn't go against the divine right of kings, but it goes against the parallel rights of the nobleman, the Magna Carta, as we said last time. So that he comes back saying, look, why do I have to obey you if you're not obeying the rules? So his idea of kingship is different. Richard, it's just enough that I'm king. That's all. Bow down. Doesn't care about the nobles or their rights. Bolingbroke is of a new generation, cares about the rights of the nobles. And it's, it's a picture, in a way, of the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of the early Renaissance. The evolution of civil rights among the people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and don't think that the founding fathers of America didn't read these plays very carefully in addition to the Roman and Greek historians and everybody else. They knew this drama. So it's, um, it penetrates. That's why I call this, what did I call it? Politics? <laughs> I don't want to talk about our politics much, but um, yeah, but the, the, um, the nature of, of man as a political animal Aristotle says man is a political animal. What does he mean? Man is that creature that lives in a polis. What is a polis? A city, state, an organization, a community, a structure of some social kind. That's man's nature. And so how do you live in that state? Um, peacefully and harmoniously. For Rousseau, it's leave the state behind and go out into the wilderness and be natural. And Summerhill School was an outgrowth of that and all the other John Dewey and other kinds of poisonous attempts to treat man as naturally good. Um, the older dispensation teaches us that man is potentially good and or evil and has to be trained to be good. But uh, for Shakespeare, the, the harmony of the universe depends on man fulfilling his function in uh, that hierarchy. And that involves kingship, monarchy. But a king is also a man. So he's the, he's the state. You can't touch that. But he's also a man. And that being the case, he needs to be a good man. He needs to be a responsible man. Um, or else you have chaos and trouble. Founding fathers had a different idea. Let's not have a man at all. Let's have a structure in which the people are sovereign but under the rule of law. And 
the laws that they put in place, most of them were inherited from English legal system, which started with that Magna Carta and all the philosophical discussions that went along with it. Um, and the later philosophers like John Locke and so on, who had thought about this and built on St. Thomas Aquinas' remarkable summa, um, in which even he says an evil king can be overthrown rightfully if he's a tyrant and persecuting the people. Under God, the, God's rule is above the rule of the king. And the king, to be good, has to rule under God. And I think we have the same foundation. That's why um, the Declaration of Independence talks about nature and nature's God, because if you don't have a divine authority, then it's just a matter of opinion which rule you want to follow or which impulse you want to follow. Relativism. Total relativism. And then you say, as one nation under God. Yeah, we say that for a reason. <clears throat> If you have total relativism, then, you know, I mean, what do we say about rights? Your right to swing your arms ends at the tip of my nose. <laughs> so you can do this all you want to, but you can't do it so close that you hit me. Well, that is a principle that is founded on the equal rights of all human beings. And if you don't accept that, if you just say, no, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it, and I don't care about you, and who are you to tell me what rights are, and there's no God, I'm just going it's, to, it's, you know, Hobbes's war of all against all, or Darwin's. Uh, and people who think that they think that about the nature of reality get another think when somebody misbehaves towards them. And then they don't have any grounds to stand on to say, you shouldn't do this. Why not? It's Richard's soliloquy, Richard III's soliloquy at the end. Do you remember? Why, what am I afraid of? There's nobody here. Yeah, I'm here. Well, there's no murderer here. Yes, I'm the murderer. How can I appeal for mercy or kindness when I haven't shown any? He gets hoist with his own petard in a nice Shakespearean phrase. Do you know what that means? Blown up with his own bomb. <laughs> All right, my dears. Let's meet on Thursday, and we will read Henry the Fourth, part, part one. one.